Hello, everyone. I still got you with me. I know we're close to coffee break, and uh, you've been having a lot of sensory overload. So I thank you for, for your attention and for listening to what I have to talk about. We've heard a lot about the ultra-connected world, about everybody being on their smartphones, everybody knowing everything about everyone at all times. And I'm here today to tell you a bit about the fact that that's not really the real world. It is in London. It is in Copenhagen. It is in New York. But I'm going to try and take you back a little bit further down towards Africa and parts of the Middle East where I'm going to talk about a group of 43 million people who live as refugees, as displaced people, chased across borders, chased within their own borders, and unfortunately, very often losing contact with loved ones. I'm also going to tell you what I like to think is a remarkable story about our organization and how it came to grow and how it came to live through partnerships with interested people who seek to support our work through the everyday work that they carry out. And most of all, this is a story about family. It's a story about two brothers. And the guy to the right is my brother David, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, and how we met a young Afghan refugee named Mansoor, whom David just referred to. And Mansoor is a remarkable person. Uh, when we met him, he'd been in Copenhagen for close to five years. He had escaped out of Afghanistan with his five siblings and his parents. They'd gotten into Peshawar in Pakistan, which is a refugee city of some 2.9 million people. Utter chaos. It is permeated by dubious characters and a lot of aid workers, of course, that are there to assist the populations. The encounter we had with Mansoor that I'm going to come back to turned into two brothers helping two brothers and then into a quest to try and help a whole lot of brothers and sisters. The picture you see here I took in Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya about two months ago. And it showcases Somali refugees that have walked anywhere from four to six weeks on their way from the drought towards the Dab, towards food, towards safety. That walk is to the arid landscape of Somalia, of Kenya. It's a walk through Al-Shabaab territory. It's a walk through wild animals. When I was there, I encountered four women and three children who'd been mauled by lions. It is a walk where mothers, in desperation, place their two-year-old kids on trucks in the hopes that they're going to make it to a camp and survive. It's a walk where parents bury their children. This is where it all began. It's a lot of dots. We like to think of it as about 43 million dots that we need to help. When Mansour had fled the Taliban and gotten into Pakistan, and from there on, he had a human trafficker. They'd paid a handsome amount to help them onwards towards Denmark. They'd heard about Denmark as a place that was democratic, that was open to help, that was open to provide them with safety. On the eve of their departure, the trafficker came into the apartment they were staying in and said, I've got a bus outside waiting with one vacant seat in it. And I don't send out buses with vacant seats, so now it's up to you to figure out who of the family is going to travel first and the rest will follow. And Mansoor was the oldest at 12 and agreed to take that journey on his own, well knowing, of course, that his family was right behind him. Three months ensued where we've been trying to piece together what happened, but given the traumatic circumstances, much has been forgotten. But we know that he went by train, by bus, walking. We know that at one point he spent three weeks living under the floorboards of an apartment in, in, in Russia with 15 other refugees, having 30 minutes of airtime every day while waiting for a new bus to bring them onwards. And to make a, a very long story shorter, Mansour finally made it to Denmark at the age of 12, was picked up by the authorities, placed into the asylum process, and sat down and waited for his family to arrive. They'd promised that. And a week passed, and he was hoping. And a month passed, and he was hoping. And two months passed, and so did his hope. Now, the only thing that's remarkable about Mansour's story is the fact that it is really, 
really unremarkable. This happens every day, thousands and thousands of times over. What we ended up doing, my brother and myself, was to say to Mansoor, look, this is the year 2005. We can help you. Let's go out there and search and see what we can come across. There must be all kinds of remedies towards such a problem. So we spoke with the refugee agencies. We spoke with the government institutions. We went far and wide in our search and far beyond what any refugee could ever go because we were Danes. We had access to people of authority. We commanded language. We had everything refugees do not, and still we found very few things. And months into the search that brought us into contact with people so full of goodwill and good intentions, but at the same time also into a system that felt very big, very bureaucratic, very much to the point of being able to focus on the 43 million people. But when it came to that one person in the midst of it all, it became that much more difficult. We ended up sending Mansoor back to Pakistan, where he, after nine days of search in Peshawar, ran into the trafficker that had shipped him out five years earlier and bribed him into disclosing that his one younger brother was now in the south of Russia in a city called Stavropol, not far from the Chechen border. And the reason the guy knew this was that, unlike Mansoor that had been plucked out of the flock and sent towards safety in Denmark, his nine-year-old brother had been sold into slavery to a family in this southern place. It's Mansoor to the right, and his younger brother Parwin to the left. This was shot in October 2005, after my brother and I had Parwin smuggled up from the south and flew into Moscow from Copenhagen with Mansoor to physically reunite the two brothers. And quite likely uh, a moment I'll never forget was when he stepped out of a cab and six years of uncertainty, of complete separation, was, was taken away, if just for four days. We had brought a camera to document the hardships that refugee families had to endure in this quest to try and find loved ones. And upon our return, we went through the process and said, so okay, when family members get separated in refugee camps, when they become separated during their flight, information gets caught and captured on paper with a pen. That information is then stored in a database, you'd think. That database is an archive system in some office in some northwestern place of a country that harbors maybe millions of refugees. It's not shared across countries. It's not shared across organizations. It wasn't shared across even the same branches at the same organizations in the same countries. So we went through this process and thought, well, 2005, this is really weird. Where is the information repository? that ties this information together across these conflicts and across these borders? Where is the simple database that allows not just for information to travel from organization to organization, but to include the refugees themselves in the process through technology they have access to, the mobile phone? The crucial possibility for refugees to upload information about themselves, to search and to reconnect with anonymity because contrary to what many people have been talking about today, there is a whole subset of people in this world who cannot afford to lose that anonymity because if they do, they lose their life with it. So it's a question of providing them with the simple possibility of uploading information that can tell their family members who they are and where they are, but not anybody else. In our case, it is literally a matter of life and death in certain circumstances. Of course, we're also dealing with a large subset of refugee groupings we're fine with displaying information about themselves. It's a fine balance, though. So yes, thoughts rolled and questions went, where is this system? Where is the system that, in the hands of an aid worker, inside refugee camps, becomes powerful connectors of information that can assist people just like the ones you're seeing on the screen here, tie them into a platform with a scratch card they understand, because that's what they use for a top-up when their subscription's out in the mobile phone. Why isn't this in place? How come you haven't gotten an ecosystem that seamlessly extends this information, not to figure out what we had for breakfast or to check out what Brian saw last night on HBO, but to get parents to find their children, to get brothers back with their sisters, and parents with everybody else? So we got a good idea. 
Obviously, this was lacking. And obviously, somebody had to build it. Now, it's important for me to state that I know nothing about technology. I knew very little about refugees, actually. And the same goes for my brother. And we didn't know much about organizational structures. But we did know that we came across here something that had the possibility to have a dramatic impact, a real, real-time dramatic impact on the lives of potentially millions of people. And we thought we were geniuses. And we thought, you know what? We're going to bring this to the organizations, and they're going to love us. They're going to say, wow, why hadn't we thought about this before? Let's all rally together. Let's band together like comrades here, and let's run to get this out and flying immediately. What turned out was that very few people wanted to listen to us. Most were looking at us thinking, who are these two long-haired hippies coming here telling us how to do our job? We don't think so. Um, and, you know, maybe they had something to it back then. Um, what we did find out was that for us to succeed, we needed to bring some friends so that we could be uh, a little bit bigger in the schoolyard. And what we decided to do was try and seek out a lot of people that are smarter than ourselves. And I think because of where we came from, uh, we didn't really seek help in the nonprofit sector. We went to the private sector. We didn't really come from the private sector, but we had friends that were in the private sector who were willing to listen and say, wow, fascinating story, great idea. How can we help? And so began this journey to, to break down the silos that existed and to perhaps usher in a more global collaboration between agencies where refugees are included in the process. And then began what we like to think of as a real low life open source project where we're trying to drive what we like to think is a perfect marriage between the private sector, the strategy, the structure, the discipline with the passion and with the implementation of the, of the NGO. And we grew. And I really think that one of the things we discovered early on was that everybody wanted to assist us. Everybody wanted to do good. Our quest in that process was to enable them to help us. And I think we, we really came from a point where we thought this is about connecting these dots. It's about connecting islands of goodwill until you got yourself an entire continent because everybody wanted to come and assist the situation because who could refuse helping families to reconnect? This is not about politics. It's not about religion. It's not about which war you came from, what's the drought, what's the famine. This is about family. Everybody's got them. It's the cornerstone of anything that we provide ourselves here today. We talk about being connected. If you couldn't find your children, you wouldn't be sitting here. You'd be out looking for them. If you couldn't find your siblings, it would be the same. This is the reality for a lot of people. And they don't have the luxuries that we take for granted and the possibilities. So we operated from some constructive beliefs of conscious naivety and from a win-win perspective constantly. And we pushed ahead. We saw ourselves a bit as an unwritten book where more and more people joined in to assist us and really got into a point where big global partnerships with corporations like Ericsson began seeing us develop and implement mobile platforms to allow refugees and agencies to capture information, to search, and so on via very, very simple functionalities. We're not really focused on Android or iPhones. We're focused on WAP. We're focused on how SMS can disseminate information out into very low tech areas and inform refugees about the services we provide and how they may be able to find help through what we do. And as this outreach grew, so did our impact. And it was a strategic decision to start with that we had to get momentum. We had to bring people in to assist us because that was the only way that the big boys out in the schoolyard would really listen to what we had to say. And that led towards us last year forming a partnership with the United Nations Refugee Agency that saw us rolling a pilot program in Uganda. Their employees in the field, our technology, in a perfect symbiosis with Ericsson supplying the mobile platform, MTN Group, Africa's largest mobile provider, giving away free SMSs, free access to the platforms, etc., and really seeing us grow into this year in a full global partnership between Refugees United and the UNHCR, which is looking destined to help a lot of people. 
We started in 2009 with 700 registrations. Just to give you a perspective, some of the other big traditional tracing agencies do about five to 700 registrations per year. In the year 2010, we did just about 18,000 registrations. And up until now, we're looking at about 55,000 people in our platform who are looking for their missing loved ones. Again, this is not a social network. This is more about on-ground ecosystems taking place where you come out, you push information, and you assist folks to come on, and you assist in the push of information towards them. And to further scale our work, I've actually saved a tidbit of really good news to share with you today. Um, today, the IKEA Foundation announced that, that they're contributing $3.8 million to Refugees United to help us further our implementation of tools alongside partners uh, specifically focused on the Horn of Africa. So, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go a little bit further ahead quickly because there are two things I want to talk to you about before my time rings out. What I'm most proud about with Refugees United is the fact that we're including refugees themselves in the whole tracing process. This is not about a big agency extending help to people that are helpless and just receiving the aid and then going home and waiting for them to take action. This is about trying, because we're not there yet. We're still very much trying to combine, to connect displaced people to our platform, to empower them with the possibility to act on their own behalves. I think this is the future of aid. It should no longer be a one-way street where Western agencies implement, send forth, and then look at the people that are waiting with their hands out front. These are brilliant people in many cases. We employ about 75 refugees in different camps. And they're a lot smarter than me. And they're a lot more ingenious in how they come about. Because if you're going to survive in Dadaab, you got to be pretty smart or you perish. And I think that this is teaching refugees how to fish. The last story I'm going to tell you. Um, it's about a wonderful Somali family. Um, I shot this, this picture with my phone in Dadaab um, two months ago. I was in the field working with partners uh, when I caught wind of a story of a family that had reconnected. And I, I hopped into our car, and I went off to a section of Dadaab. It's a camp with 450,000 people. And jumped out to this place called Ifal and ran to C Block 20 and began scouring the area with, with, my, with my local guy. And finally found his family, who were sitting pretty much looking like that when I walked in the door. Uh, it turns out that the mother, who's in the right-hand corner, 18 years prior, had lost contact with her two daughters. The father had taken them to Germany. And for reasons unknown, the father had been deported. The children stayed behind, were separated from him had severed contacts with the mother because at the same time, she'd been transported to Dadaab to flee the ongoing crisis in Somalia. She had been searching and searching and searching for years. She had remarried. She'd had quite a few new kids. She had been informed about Refugees United by a school teacher in Dadaab that had heard about the search she was undergoing and rushed to her house and helped her sign up and within 30 minutes, she had found her one daughter, whom she last saw when she was one years old. As the father took off with her, they reconnected. They exchanged information. That daughter was in contact with the other sister, who had now immigrated to the US. And within about 40 minutes, 18 years of silence was shattered. Because good people centered around technology and came to the assistance of those who have a lot less than most here and fostered that link. And I think, if anything, that is a testimony to the power of technology. And we view technology as an enabler, but something that comes incredibly powerful in the hands of people that have a distinct need that can be remedied. And that's the point. The problem we're trying to solve, which touches hundreds of thousands of families, millions of people, can be eradicated. Now, within the next couple of years, 
If only we can band together, and it's possible. So if any of you would like to take this journey with us, or to assist, because I know a lot of you smart people know more about technology than we do, please come see me. Thank you very much.